it's really wonderful to be a part of this and I'm really honored that uh, I am going to introduce somebody whom we all look up to and we've learned a lot from. But uh, before I go there, I was asked to also introduce in short Anthropology Without Borders. So Anthropology Without Borders uh, was set up under the rubric of the Indian Anthropological Association as a formal entity that will serve as a network of professional anthropologists who will act as critical uh, readers of policy documents for wider audiences. And AWB seeks to establish a link between groups seeking anthropological specialists who can act as critical leaders, analysts and reviewers of reports and documents to which such groups may not have access to otherwise. So the vision is to serve multiple goals, bring water, sanitation, education, etc. to the people, reviewing of papers and interventions that are going on currently in the country, reviewing of policy for the betterment of the people, shared stories and best practices, lessons learned, as well as to grow as a community. And now I will uh, also try to introduce somebody who does not really need any introduction, Professor Somendra Mohan Patnayak has taught anthropology at the University of Delhi since 1989, and he is currently the Vice Chancellor of Utkal University in Odisha. His return to Odisha after 36 years has brought out transformative change in Utkal University, as most of us are aware already. He has been a Fulbright Nehru Visiting Fellow at the University of Virginia, as well as at the University of California, Berkeley. He's been an advisor to the government of Nagaland on sustainable tourism management and policy. He's the co-founder of Anthropology Without Borders. And uh, he is, he's also done extensive fieldwork across South Asia, covering Nepal, Sri Lanka, Eastern and Central India, as well as the Northeast. And he has international publications, a lot of them to his credit. He has over four books and 40 research papers. His areas of interest, include anthropology of development and globalization, indigenous communities, ethnographic methods, public policy, anthropology of tourism. And currently he's the president of the Indian Anthropological Association, the vice president of IUAES, chair uh, uh, of its scientific commission on anthropology and public policy and development practice. So we really would like to, sir, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to you. And uh, we are really privileged to hear you today talk about fear, uncertainty, and ethics of social research. Over to you, sir. Sir, we can't hear you, sir. Good morning, everybody. I'm, I'm extremely happy that this workshop is being organized at such a scale where more than 500 anthropologists and social scientists are together to reflect on the contemporary challenges of social research. And as you know, that anthropology is a discipline which is closer to ground but not shy from abstraction. It travels beginning from a grounded reality to the realities of higher order and thereby crossing the limits of anthropological discipline, the boundaries of anthropological discipline. And when we planned this workshop, I think my colleagues, Professor Mehrutra, Professor Avitoli, when uh, they, uh, they planned this, I was very happy to say that anthropology without border can contribute immensely to the understanding of the entire, uh, entire uh, process of, of in silo or transcending the in silo understanding of the disciplines. Now let me begin with <coughs> the, the point where Professor Merotra left. She talked about you know, the new, new sociality. And when we say this new sociality, this new sociality talks about a new kind of relationship between self and community, 
a new kind of orientation of all our researchers, all our research process towards understanding this new sociality and whether it is a new normal or whether it is a new pathological or whether it is a new aberration or a new natural, that is up to all of you to explore and find out. The second point I would like to talk about here is that can we really say and can we really argue that something called sociology of fear or anthropology of fear and uncertainty? Is there something called anthropology of fear and uncertainty? Now to, to explore this and primarily to talk about such phenomenon in a research context or in the context of the young researchers, the neophytes, those who are always very, very creative because the creativity lies in asking the question in a new way, in asking a new question. And all those new questions and no, new ways of asking questions hold promises for creativity and hold promises for future paradigm and future revelation within the discipline or across the discipline. So to do so, I would touch upon the very basis of anthropological foundation. What is the very basis of anthropological foundation? The very basis of anthropological foundation is most of our predecessors and very, very luminaries. They have always said that like Professor Madan, T.N. Madan would say that anthropology is the mutual interpretation of each other's culture. And when we are going for a mutual interpretation of each other's culture, the whole idea which Professor Mehrutra also talked of, that a new kind of relationship between self and community, a new kind of relationship between self and other. So far, we have emphasized or we have put maximum emphasis on the other. To, to understand the other, we have developed the methods of ethnography 100 years before and for 100 years we have been experimenting that how this new method or how this innovative method of ethnographic research could be used not only within anthropology but beyond anthropology in terms of media studies, in terms of political science, in terms of public policy, in terms of culture, drama, dance, music, fine arts, everywhere it could be used. But we have never been so particular about discovering how this mutuality between self and other is understood. And this mutuality is more important. It's not a question of discovering one or other. Because when we talk about, when we talk about the other, you will find that the anthropological literature is full of this particular, particular discourse, how to understand the other and who are these other, the Dalit other, the other gender, or the other, other, other the, the, the domestic other, the, the political other, all those kinds of other. And if you look into the philosophy, you will find you will find too much of exercise being done on the self, too much of exercise being done on, on, on the Indological, from an Indological point of view, that how we have to understand the self. And self is something which we always carry, whether we understand it or not, that is always there with us. And therefore, this mutuality between self and the community, the mutuality between self and the field, which is very, very central. And please, uh, please, I would like to reiterate a very, very obvious thing that those who run after the textbooks of methodology and those who run after the traditionally established ways of doing research, they are holding less promises of being creative. And therefore, my sincere advice to all the young researchers, the seniors are better than me, all the young researchers that never be oblivious to a very simple and ordinary question. The question could be comparable with why the apple is falling from the tree. So the whole idea of asking a simple question and that that be that sensitivity has to be kept in mind in the in the whole in the whole process of the social research, which is intended to discover the new sociality, a new orientation between self and other. Now in the pandemic. I think the realization, I mean, this is the necessity. What I have just talked about is the necessity, the requirement during the pandemic, the necessity on the part of the researcher. Now, during the pandemic, what has been the realization? The realization, one realization is that, that which I have been telling in most of the, most of the lectures uh, after I started uh, interacting with the world during the pandemic, 
that that in 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 during this pandemic the humanity have experienced a historically unparalleled situation of what is what could be called as a controlled and experimental earth a controlled planet and an experimental planet planetary situation and and i always give this example of the two terms that the present world always talks of uh, of an a, a human centric activity so far so far we have been talking about an excessive human activity on this world and that excessive human activity has been primarily understood in terms of anthropocene but after the pandemic this human activity has suddenly ceased and at least for few months in most of the countries and when it suddenly ceased to exist it has created a new concept of anthropos there is a pause of human activities and during this pause we have seen how human activity has been has been atrocious on this planet and how this this whole earth is was was let us say undergoing pain and sufferings and and miseries because when this anthropos started this 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 uh, this pausing of human activities you find new species coming up in the uttarakhand new 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 flowers blooming there and the new kind of cleanliness in the ganges when the industry stopped we don't have to spend so much of money to clean ganga because it is it is we who are causing such kind of pollution so this reflexivity about the planet about the earth let us find out how it has contributed to the understanding of our social research how the understanding of your your social research when we do research i think there is a there is a there is a very important bias and what is that bias i am trying to make a distinction between between the social world of research and the and the individual process of research one is the social world on which we carry out the research and and on social world of research we have structure functionalist we have uh, conflict theorist we have symbolic interactionism we have phenomenologist so this social world on which the research is constituted has always been understood in a diverse perspective like edmund leach could say, could say real societies exist in time and space and real societies are full of competitions contradictions and conflict and 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 the manchester school would talk about more about the conflict so conflict in a structural way that we all know let's come to the process of research the process in which an individual is exposed to the research and i'm talking about the official process i'm talking about the public process i'm not talking about the private process which is very very significant and this is the time when we should realize about what is going on with us as a private person or as an individual as an individual researcher and that is that kind of reflexivity we need to have because because unless we are we are critically reflexive of our role our position it would be very difficult to cope up with the challenges of the pandemic so what is the process of or what is the individual process of social research the individual process of social research has always been suffering from a structural functional point of view and i think i am not denying it because we always think that 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 a process has to start with a pilot study has to start with a conceptualization of research a design and the pilot study should culminate in a deeper study deeper study should culminate in the text and and the analysis so we take it as a kind of organized social process of conducting the research but the pandemic has challenged this very particular question and when pandemic has challenged that in world or in 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 the world in which we live things are never stable and never smooth and history is the witness and the diversity is is the corroboration that social world is always full of uncertainties and i would like to say that when i will discuss about fear and un uncertainty i would like to make a distinction between the fear and uncertainty because fear refers to a kind of emotions a kind of emotions which has a stronger biochemical component than other emotions now now the swenden one of the one of the philosopher swenden has talked about that how human emotions have a biological basis but they are shaped by individual experiences 
and social norms and that's a that's a very holistic way of understanding the the emotions and and fear is one of the emotions which is which has a biological basis but the individual it is shaped by individual experiences as well as the social norms out of all these emotions which which we can say that jealousy that uh, that uh, that uh, that lust the the kind of you know the competition competitiveness they are all uh, having different kind of biological component but fear has a stronger biological component but it is something which obstructs the reason reason is the capacity to behave consciously in terms of the nature of what we do not constitute ourselves we are more instinctive we are more spontaneous and 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 reason creates a a soothing boundary for intellectual pursuit and when we are fearful we are we are blurring the reason and therefore the the idea of fear and reason is in exist in terms of polar opposites and this this polar opposites because fear is something which is unfounded generally i mean very few very few percentage of fears are real fear and people have distinguished between real and unsubstantiated fear but most of the fear is always about if something happens and 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 that creates the the blurring of the reason that creates the blurring of the the free intellect and and that we need to well guard in the contemporary social research coming to uncertainty when we talk about uncertainty we know that in uncertainty there is there is the beauty of life a young boy or a young girl went to an astrologer and said that nothing is happening in my life what is to be done astrologer said that i can predict but i don't want to predict when you are so young it's not it's not the time to do astrology in life because suppose i predict you that at the age of 25 you will get a job at the age of 27 you will get married at the age of 28 you will have problem with your spouse and at the age of 29 you will remarry at the age of 32 you will get another promotion at the age of 35 you may lose your grandparent whom you love so intensely at the age of 40 you will go abroad at the age of 45 you will acquire an uh, nri or green card and then you will settle there and and so many predictions and finally maybe this is the last day or this is the last year in your life life becomes so boring it becomes so useless that you know everything like it like a programmatic code and therefore the beauty of life lies in uncertainty i always say that life is is the uncertainty between two certainties the two certainties are the birth and the death and between that the uh, the, the bliss of uncertainty is the life and 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 that is something which we should we should learn to live in we should not get stuck to some other positions that that world was like this and therefore the world should be like this in research the primary slogan is we should not get stuck either to isms to theories to methods to disciplines we need to move on we should not get stuck to places we should not get stuck to 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 anything in in that that imposes some kind of inhibition some kind of boundary some kind of immobility we must move on and and therefore let us examine that how such an analysis which we are proposing helps us in understanding three things in research i would like to revolve around these three things number one the social field or the field of study number two the techniques of study or the methods of study and finally the process of analysis with special reference to data language and production of the text these are the three important points and three sub points around which i will try to sum up now when you talk about the social field or when you talk about the universe of study it is it is very central as <coughs> as uh, professor merutra said that we have to discover a new kind of sociality a new kind of field not that the pandemic has has created this necessity but technology has already created this necessity much earlier in social research technology is becoming 
more and more central and 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 if we keep on thinking that some of us have access to technology and some of some of us do not have access to technology or if we keep on thinking that technology is going to create uncertainty in in social research then we start developing fear and and this fear of technology has to be transcended i was very worried when some of the school teachers in west bengal and in other other states they were humiliated they were harassed because they could not deal with technology and to tell you the truth i also cannot deal with technology sometimes i deal i i need to take the help of my family members i take they need to take the help of my colleagues sometimes i call them and they come running to to my residence or to my office to help me i'm so obliged to them because but somehow we have to adjust we have to adjust that we can't keep saying that that this is an obstruction this is an uncertainty and therefore it induces fear we must transcend it transcend this and social research the contemporary social research has to start discussing about it. sorry how technology has to be used and how i was reading reading an article in the journal of royal anthropological institute of london long ago when i was teaching at delhi university that that article was very much talking about a cell phone that how technology or or technology coming in for, in terms of a cell phone was emancipating was empowering the village women in bangladesh and these i'm forgetting the name of the author now the <clears throat> the village women in bangladesh became empowered because they could connect with their sororal kins they could connect with their their sorority the the relationship among other women and and reinforcing some kind of solidarity and support for each other in their natal clan and and they could travel they could really resist the oppression of the patriarchal society with the help of a mobile phone but look at the other side of technology what the men of the village did they organized these videos and you know these lcds and other and they insisted that when the movies can be seen within the domestic space women don't need to go to the movie hall which was giving them a some kind of freedom the of mobility some kind of breathing space outside the traditionally uh, traditionally demanding domestic chores but but this technology of watching movie through videos and through lcds and through so many things which i do not know created mobility obstruction or created obstruction of the mobility of the women so technology could be double edged weapon we should start talking about it we should start talking about how technology is affecting the researcher and researcher when i was doing field work among bhil to which supriya was instrumental in in organizing that field work among the bhil and uh, during this field work among the bhil in in 2006 i think uh, delhi university team went and we we came up with a book on team ethnography and that is that is available some of the researchers should see this now during the team ethnography and during that bhil uh, we found interesting thing about the social field or or what constitutes the social field some of the students who come back the the bhil sub chabua tell me that sir the informants are not very interested in to us primarily because by the time the informants are busy in tracing their own friends in communication super highways through internet through email through skype and this this communication super highway was was the thing of the day in the urban towns of chabua but what used to happen in the rural villages in the same distance in the rural villages we were going and we suddenly found that a mobile telephone hanging from a tree i was surprised that somebody has left it i talked to the household which was nearby i mean just just 10 feet away there was a small hut i talked to the person that who has left the mobile there he said nobody has left this is the mobile for those people who have moved out of the village and who are working in surat and in other parts of gujarat as as the laborer in the garment industry when their phone comes somebody who is passing by or somebody who is staying in that household would come and pick up that i will call my wife after 10 hours or after 5 hours or i will talk to my daughter my son after 5 after 2 hours so after 2 hours the person will come 
stand near the tree and receive the phone look how technology which was used in a collective way an individual phenomenon of mobile phone mobile phone we can't we, we and these days we think that unless there is a uh, fingerprint it will not open there is there is there is so the informations in the within the mobile is so well guarded at a personal plane but this was a mobile which was in public display and was acting like a public booth but a, a mobile telephone different adaptation to technology has led us to different kind of understanding of the social field they would they would adapt on one of the occasions i was talking to a wheel in the same field work and suddenly i i found that he disappeared he disappeared but his voice was coming i looked here and there and then i looked up he had climbed the tree because he had to make a call and the network was not clear on the ground then he had to climb the tree where the network is clear and this is what the local bheels in the tribals they knew that, that that how to adapt the 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 technology and therefore when we talk about information flow when we talk about communication super highways this whole natural setting of the social phenomena becomes different ethnography begins with the first sentence that it's a closer study of of a social phenomena in natural setting so the natural setting of the social phenomena is changing because of technology and this natural setting of the social phenomena is undergoing rapid transformation and what the new sociality or the new field is nothing but but a mixture of the local and global it's a it's a combination of you will find the elements of local local there and you will also find the elements of global there and therefore the the social researcher should not miss out on these kind of composite nature of the social field and this this composite nature of social social field has also contributed to blurring of boundaries and this is the last point in the social field before i move to the technique and methods with the online teaching the 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 schools colleges and universities have entered into the domestic sphere the academic field has entered into the domestic field and and therefore we have to talk about new kind of ethics we have to talk about new kind of morality and we have to talk about that how to be presentable in front of the camera many a times it gives me uh, very 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 unacceptable Uh, uh, feelings when i see some of the delegates not here but but in other places they are lying down they are eating something they are not clothed properly they are not well dressed for the occasion that's that's not the, that's no more the domestic space my dear friends that has become an official space and this new space has to be discovered this new space has to be realized and this new space has to be constructed through a discourse through a dialogue and that will clear or that will emerge to new ethics of social research of interacting with the field and when this online education is entering into the household field a new kind of morality a new kind of 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 intellectual commitment is something which we need to understand now coming to the second point of our of our methodology when we talk about the techniques and methods now this is this is something which is very very important and in this techniques and methods how to deal with fear how to deal with 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 fear because it is the fear and the reason it is the mind it is the mindfulness or it is the complete complete uh, complete detachment from the mindfulness which is which is the question of the hour that what is required what how how it has to be done in the context of in the context of the social science research now in this in this situation i would like to i would like to argue that that uh, that fear comes up like ethics it, with which i would like to uh, weave it with with ethics like ethics fear is also a product of mutuality and and when we say that for example 
one of the philosopher, Indian philosopher, Jiddu Krishnamurti had said that fear comes of many reasons, but two important reasons are desire and comparison with others. Researchers, we cannot say that stop your desire. We have to desire. We have to compete. We have to run for excellence. And that is something which fear has to, gen has to be generated and we have to handle it. But I think comparison with others is something which can be handled much more easily than the fear of desire or fear generated through the desire. Because, because it is important to understand what is, what is an, if we talk about anthropology of fear or if we talk about sociology of fear, it is also important to know how fear is understood in different cultural contexts. When we talk about Krishnamurti's philosophical postulates, we are talking about comparison with others and we are talking about the generation of, of, of desire. And sometimes the fear is also very positive because fear is intended by nature to be protective. It's a protective mechanism to safeguard us from the perils of life. And therefore, therefore fear may be, may be very, 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 very positive at times. And, and it is important to understand the location of the fear in ourself. And it is important to understand that how, how this knowledge generation and knowledge production is affected by the fear. I would like to quote, I think I have very, very less time. Another, another, I'll just wind up in a few minutes. Now, I think I would like to quote the famous classical Indologist, Bhatrihari. Bhatrihari wrote Vairagya Satakam. And in this Vairagya Satakam is all about transcending the desire, which is, a, which is something which we need to understand much more clearly. In Vairagya Satakam, one of the slokas or one of the verses, verses number 31, talks about the following translation. Please pay attention to this, which will help us in understanding the fear. In sensual indulgence, there is fear of desire. In noble birth, there is fear of fall from status. In wealth, there is fear of king taking it away. In honor, there is fear of losing it. In beauty, there is fear of old age. In erudition, there is fear of a stronger scholar. In worthiness, there is fear of a villain. And in human body, there is a fear of death. And likewise, fear is there in all other human qualities, except for non-attachment, where alone, there is fearlessness. But this is something which, which we need to work on, not only within the discipline, but outside the discipline, with the, during our life, that how a researcher needs to be immersed into the social world and also need to remain outside and, 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 and some kind. One should be detached at the same time, completely immersed. And therefore, it is it is argued that that when we talk about uh, about the fear and when we talk about this kind of of methods all these methods which we develop in in social science research we should develop it in the during the interface between the self and other there has to be more emphasis on the interface between self and other rather than purely an attempt to understand the other there has to be an adequate attempt to understand the self and this, this adequate attempt to understand the self comes from such kind of realizations that how there could be, there could be a new mechanism of rupture. And, and Professor Mehrutra said that this new mechanism of disruption and this reflexivity which helps us to understand over time and space what we are doing. And what we are doing is something which which has many examples, but I don't want to go into, into that. Finally, I would like to conclude that in qualitative research, 
writing data involves stages of analysis in quantitative research there are statistical methods used for the data analysis and with the technology with the statistical packages that are available it is very easy on our part to carry out the data analysis but i'm not going to talk about that i'm going to talk about that how language becomes a central component of understanding how language becomes a central component how language becomes a central component of understanding the findings and revelations of it and to do so i would like to give you an example of what derrida thought and what what jacques derrida thought there is a piece during which he is talking about the fear of writing what exactly he is meaning by by this writing i am i'm i'm telling you once and all that uh, that this this writing part is something which contains little bit of analysis or much of the analysis according to derrida people have a fear of writing and he had it writing talks of a dualistic process of intellectual creation and this dualistic process of intellectual creation talks of two processes one an unconsciously but consciously anxiety or consciously anxious and second one is something which is imperative urgently required one is an anxiety the other one is a requirement very beautiful example with which i will conclude derrida says that each time i write something it feels like i am advancing into a new territory somewhere i have i have not been before and this type of advance often demands certain gestures that can be taken as aggressive with regard to other colleagues with regard to other institutions because he is critiquing them when he is critiquing them he is comparing it as a travel into a new territory with an aggressive stand and so every time i make this type of gesture there are moments of fear but there is no doubt about the fact that he was enjoying it and this is he is writing consciously with sense of anxiety but sometimes he has a different feeling when he do not write and when he do not write for days and he go to sleep he finds that a very crazy thing happening when he is sleeping all of a sudden he wakes up terrified by a reminder that what he is doing somebody tells him that you are crazy you are critiquing these people you are critiquing these authorities you are critiquing this text and institutions and therefore it creates a panic in the subconsciousness he is concluding of this two or he is summarizing providing a meaning to these two kinds of phenomenon the two kinds of phenomenon he says that there exists some kind of vigilance on the self when he is half asleep the vigilance is much more pronounced but when he is fully awake the vigilance is not pronounced when he is half asleep the vigilance comes up and tells him the truth what is the truth not that he is writing nonsense the truth is that he is doing something very serious but when he is awake this vigilance is asleep and therefore there is a need to understand this half awakened situation which individual experiences in different state of consciousness and in indian indian philosophy this is called turiya t u r i y a this turiya avastha turiya avastha is a state of consciousness which is before salvation or before the samadhi it is 
a location of the self at the boundary of consciousness and unconsciousness at the boundary of dark consciousness which sigmund freud would say unconscious and freud would say 95% of our personality is unconscious and 5% of our personality is conscious and it is this derrida's concept of the vigilance during a sleep there is somebody who is watching him during the sleep telling him during the sleep indian concept of the turiya which is the liminal stage between the consciousness and the unconsciousness it it peeps into the consciousness and unconsciousness and this dark consciousness is the location of the fear and the 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 bright consciousness is the location of the reason and faith faith in god surrender in god which is located in a bright consciousness which only exist in terms of 5% of us as far as sigmund freudian analysis concern needs to be discovered both the consciousness needs to be discovered through a liminal stage of researchers understanding and it is only through that state we can transcend the fear and anxiety because during the fear we may understand the ethical issues very very wrongly we may be routinized we may be we may be eager to complete our research not following the ethical guidelines or not 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 compatible to the ethical guidelines but finally i would like to say and quoting it from immanuel kant that that there is no ethical considerations if there is no presence of other and there is no fear if there is no presence of other and this mutuality of self and other which has been a central concern of anthropological discourse has to be kept in mind has to be discovered and i am sure the remaining two days of our discourse will talk about how there could be an anthropological location of a researcher using various strategies inventing various 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 ideologies or or ideological locations to deal with the discipline which is growing very fast and which will grow much faster in coming years in india all my best wishes and blessings thank you thank you very much sir for that very insightful lecture and like you rightly said i think uh, our dependence on technology and all the work that we are doing today is probably making all of us a society that is data rich but information poor and uh, in all of this your uh, guidance on self reflexivity in reaching that liminal stage where one can uh, overcome fear and start working towards something more constructive is something that i think all of us will take away with us in all our work not only in research and uh, as i've already pointed out uh, all the participants in case you have any questions for sir you are most welcome to type those questions in the chat box and we will take them up like sir said it's the journey that matters and we are all living in a composite social field wherein all of us need to be more conscious about what we are doing and how we do that because we are definitely going through a period of unprecedented change with very high levels of uncertainty anxiety social isolation financial pressures and even mental health which is likely at risk for a lot of us these raise concerns on how governments civil society and researchers can come together to support long term health and recovery in social economic and even psychological terms so it's here in this uh, sphere that we are looking for ways to you know overcome this are we we personally even i am trying to see what will a post pandemic world mean what does it mean is there anything called a post pandemic world what will it mean will it mean major changes to our lives there are questions of equity and equality that we need to address as we go through this pandemic then as individuals are we doing enough whatever little ways that we are trying to change ourselves and remodel ourselves and our lives around this pandemic are we doing enough for ourselves and others around us so how do we retailer our lives and reduce the negative impacts that we have on the environment and on each other subsequently how do we improve the resilience among communities and resilience of people to overcome such fears and uncertainties 
So, sir, I've received a couple of questions here. Uh, I'll just read them out to you, sir. And uh, be, uh, there is a shortage of time, so maybe we can take a couple of questions now and all the other questions subsequently, I will do pass them on to uh, Professor Patnayak and we'll try to answer them. Okay. So, sir, there's a... a Question saying, while reading research journals, a lot of themes and issues have uh, shown interconnectivity. How should a scholar stick to what his or her agenda of investigation is and avoid excessive literature reviewing, moving away from the topic which is required? I think uh, there is a special session on literature review, but I will just answer it in one line. Research involves decision making and these decisions are to be made by the researcher and research is always an art of knowing the decision making. If we start reading the whole of newspaper every day, we will stop going to office and complete it only in the evening. Selectivity is, a, is something which researchers should know. Researchers should know how to avoid the unnecessary things and that judgment will emerge with the researcher over time. And that is why the PhD admissions are taken care of that which literature you should read, which literature you should not read. And that has to be learned by the researcher. So I think it's a learning process and it's, it doesn't come to you overnight. So there's another interesting question. Could you uh, say something more about the academic or pedagogic field moving into the domestic? Yes, when we talk about uh, when we talk about this uh, domestic and academic and pedagogic field moving into the domestic, I think I will talk about a most practical and logistic consideration. When we were students, we we used to spend whenever there is a possibility, we used to spend in the hostels. And one of in, in my in my initial years of Delhi days, and one of the teachers told that unless you go to a space, which Professor D K Bhattacharya told me, uh, unless you go to a space like a space which is a formal space, a space which is like library or the department uh, study room, and somewhere you sit, you you cannot be productive because a domestic space is always a lazy space. A domestic space is always a space where multiple things are there. You are at your ease, you are relaxed. I would like to find out that when a domestic space or uh, academics and research and the pedagogy enters into the domestic space, I what I would like to see for future is that there has to be a space for office activity within the domestic space. And, and that space, I always tell my students that you, you may not come to the department, you may not come to the, to the library, but create a study space where you can sit in your, in your formal dress. And sometimes, you know, I insist that you should wear the shoes and sit in the, in the formal place. Because if you are not wearing the shoes, you feel like taking the rest with the fraction of a second. There are, there are, there are embodiment of a formal space and that embodiment has to come to the domestic space and you, unless you follow it, it would be difficult. Second answer I would like to say that a domestic space may be, may be very, very conducive to some people and it may not be conducive to other people, but we have to develop, strategize and develop how it can be more conducive in terms of our individual requirement, in terms of our individual uh, desire. Thank you. So there's another interesting question. Uh, uh, you've been asked, could you highlight fear as agentive and constructive for research? Fear can generate new questions as well, and it can create opportunities. What are adjectives? Can you repeat? But agentive, agentive and constructive. Fear as agentive and constructive for research. Okay. How can it generate See, new questions? Yes, yes. There is an agency of fear, no doubt about it. And, and unless, and, and what role does that play? I mean, if you are a research scholar, if you are submitting your thesis and you do not have the fear at the time of submission, you have not attained the quality. It is the fear of revision 
it is the fear of rejection of your thesis which will guide you to the extent that you excel because if you think that you will submit a thesis and it will pass through and if there is no fear remember that you are not doing a quality work i think most of us those who have crossed this stage those who have earned the degree of phd they know that there was so much of anxiety so much of uncertainty there was so much of so called fear which has pushed us to a particular stage that let's try to produce our best and then surrender it with the with the almighty or destiny and and that is the agency of the fear fear drives you to a limit where you perform the best thank you very much sir so there are a lot of other questions but we have crossed the time already so we will uh, forward you all the questions and uh, some of them also want to know all the uh, literature that you have referred to derrida for derrida and for uh, the other uh, aspects oh yes. oh yes i will i will i'll share my apology to the next speaker i don't know who is the next speaker no problem sir okay thank you thank very you. much sir i hand over to dr avitoli